Hey, I want you to turn your, uh, in your Bibles, if you would, begin with to Joshua chapter 24. Um, I do want to uh, say, uh, as I begin the message this morning, and uh, please forgive me if I, I don't want to take too long to say this, that this is a study on habits uh, or a continuation of looking at different verses that we believe that God wants us, things that God wants us to change in our life. And... Um, uh, but it's built around the idea of making the right choices and uh, developing really good godly habits in our life. I, I want to say to you, as your pastor, this comes from my heart, uh, that sort of the uh, uh, input that I've had over the last two years in the three series that we've done connecting my mind with my life, uh, encouraging words, and this one on embracing change has really been designed to create what I want to call a paradigm shift. Uh, uh, just for years and years and years and years and years, uh, I have taught here um, every conceivable kind of uh, Message we've studied books of the Bible. We studied all of the Old Testament prophets, uh, both the major prophets, the minor prophets. We've done. We've gone through the Bible in a survey form uh, in the Progress of Redemption twice. Um, we've taught books of the Bible from uh, passages in the Bible, from the Sermon on the Mount to. John to Acts to Romans uh, to Galatians, Ephesians, uh, Colossians, uh, 1 Timothy, 1 Peter, 1 John, Revelation. We've taught every doctrine that is conceivable. We've gone through a systematic study of theology from the doctrine of the Word, the doctrine of God, the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, the doctrine of the Church doctrine of angels, uh, just every conceivable doctrine that we could think of. Uh, we've looked at the differences between reformed doctrine, non-reformed doctrine. Uh, we have studied tulip, you know, total depravity and limited atonement, all those kind of things. We have looked doctrinally at every possible conceivable uh, area of scripture that we could. And one of the things that I felt like in my own personal life, uh, or one of the reasons that I began to embrace teaching just a little bit differently, was because, um, and one of the things that I consistently try to teach my students is that Information alone is not transformational. There has to come a place in your life when you take the information that you know and the information that you learn and then you have to put that information into practice. Um, and I just felt like that was an area in our church that I had never really emphasized quite as much as I have been. Uh, I want to say to you, just as your pastor, from my heart, just uh, I'm not trying to change anybody. One of the things that I understand and appreciate as a pastor is that I cannot change anybody. I'm not trying to change you. I certainly am never going to lord over you at all. Uh, uh, I want you to make your own decisions. But I know that your decisions and our choices have a great impact on the direction of of our life. But everything that I'm teaching you in these sections, let's take today's study about embracing change, um, uh, that we were talking about the idea of being spiritually minded, that's where this sort of started four or five weeks ago, is that everything that I am teaching you and all of the principles that I give to you, I am I am embracing them in my own life. I'm making changes. We had a funny conversation the other day with my daughter and my wife <laughs> a couple of nights ago. 
I called my daughter to, I forget what I called you about, sweetheart, but I was going to ask her a question or something. And then Brenda was in the room and they started talking. And so I'm, I'm really working on this idea of that when somebody's interrupting me that I just stop talking. So I just stopped talking and finally my wife looked at me and I was just sitting there and she, she started laughing and then Patience started laughing and, and, uh, uh, but I'm really working on it. And I ask you to work on it with me. I don't know if you are, if you have, or if you haven't. Uh, sort of up to you, huh? I'm, trying. I, I'm doing it, I'm, I'm really doing it. If, if we have a conversation today and you interrupt me, I'm gonna stop. And I'm just gonna keep looking at you and uh, not trying to intimidate you in any way, but just, I want to implement that in my life. But that's just one of different areas of my life that I'm trying to integrate into my life. I'm trying to put into practice what I'm actually teaching you. And so these studies are designed to be very practical. I'm going to make some adjustments after the first of the year and uh, teach on uh, some other things, uh, get more back into the scriptures a little bit. But I still want to embrace, I still want to include uh, the idea of application and encouragement as a, whatever new series that I actually begin. I was thinking that as we, uh, we begin a new year, what I wanted you to do today, and I want you to just uh, please let me encourage you to do it, is I want you to take a close look at your life. Um, I want you to look at your life, and I want you to, if possible, uh, to identify any bad habits that you think that you may have in your life. We're talking about habits, we're talking about choices. I want you just to think about it, I gave you a notebook last week, you can, you can write that down, uh, those things that you think that you would like to change. And I would just say to you that every one of us in this room today have some habits that we probably need to get rid of. Uh, and we want to find out what to do after we recognize what those bad habits are. We want to figure out what we have to do to, I'm not, I'm not even sure the right word is to replace, but to rid ourselves of them and then develop good habits in our life that would honor and really glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'll give you a verse here in a minute that talks about the test that we ought to take, the scriptural test that we ought to take to see if that's actually happening in our, in, in our life. And so we want to figure out how to get rid of the bad habits and then how to replace them with God, godly habits. Now, here's what I know. You ought to write this down. Here's what I know. I know that bad habits are bad masters. Bad habits are bad masters. Let's just say that you smoke. Somebody smokes. That's a bad habit, right? And eventually, that bad habit is going to have a very negative impact on somebody's life. It's going to shorten their life. It's going to shorten the quality of their life. It's going to... Uh, we had a, a, a member here that passed away years and years ago, and my wife and I really could not go to their home. Because every day, both uh, this man and his wife they would smoke three packs of cigarettes a day. A day, a piece. <clears throat> That's a lot of cigarettes. I mean, if you take 60 cigarettes and you divide it by the 16 hours that you may be up, I mean, you're smoking almost four cigarettes an hour. An hour. That, that's not a good habit, right? Good habits, I mean, bad habits are really really bad masters that any, anybody could have in their life. So the message this morning is designed to help us understand how we can specifically get rid of some bad habits. I don't think it's very hard. I don't think it's difficult, hopefully, to be helpful to you. But what we know is that the longer that we maintain a bad habit in our life, the more entrenched it becomes in our life. In other words, the harder it is to get rid of. 
you'll find in your own life that if you have a bad habit and you really enjoy the bad habit, that what you'll do is that you'll rationalize and justify and come up with all the reasons why it's okay to keep your bad habit when all along you know that it's not a good habit. And that ultimately, eventually, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not next week, maybe not by the end of this year, but at some point in time, it's going to have a bad impact on your life. It's just reality. That's just the way that it works. The bad habits are bad habits because they are entrenched into your life. Because they are anchored. They, they're sort of cemented in, into your life. So the ultimate goal is to get rid of our bad habits and to develop some good habits that actually will benefit that will benefit our life. If I can, I, I, I want you to think of it this way. Think of it this way, just to make the contrast, is that ungodly habits will never benefit your life. Ungodly habits will never benefit your life, but godly habits will always benefit your life. So if you want your life to have some meaningful benefit to it, establishing godly, godly habits in your life is a good place to actually a good place to actually start. Now here's the principle that we, we're going to begin to study this morning. Here's the principle that I want you to write down, all right? Our choices create our habits. Write that down. Our choices create our habits. You make a choice at some point in time. It could be a year ago, 10 years ago. It doesn't really matter, but you made a choice, and that choice created a habit. I, I, didn't, I never knew my dad... Mom and dad got divorced when I was really young. I told you this story many times, but my dad made a really bad choice. He made a bad choice that he was going to uh, uh, that he was going to drink, all right? And ultimately, it, it created a habit in his life where he began to drink all the time. He became an alcoholic, and he died at the age of 54 or 55. Ruined his family abandoned his family, abandoned his children, abandoned his wife. He had, he made a choice and that choice created a habit. Now it works both ways. You can create, you can have, make a good choice, right? Let's just say for instance, you make a choice that you're not going to drive fast. That, that can have good results in your life and it can become a really, really good habit. So your choices are what actually create your habits. Now here's how it all works. Here's how it works. This is very simple. We make a choice. We, we just make a choice in our life, and then our choice, because we've made a choice, our choice moves us in a certain direction. Uh, you, you may have made the choice. I've made the choice a long time ago. I've made the choice that I'm a, I'm a church nut. I come to church all the time. I come to church every time the doors are open. I've done this all my life for the last 52 years of, my, of, of being a Christian. I made a choice, and that choice moved me in a certain direction, and then it became a habit in my life. Everybody see that? Everybody understand that? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Uh, you, you make a choice, good or bad. It doesn't matter. It, it, that choice that you make is going to push you and move you in a certain direction and eventually that will become a habit in your life. For instance, let's just say that you choose to treat people with disrespect. You just make a choice. You're not going to, you're not going to, your choice is, is that you're going to say what you want to say. You're going to treat people the way that you want to to treat them and you wind up treating them with disrespect and eventually your disrespect becomes a habit in your life, a really bad habit where you don't respect people. Uh, but if you choose to treat people with respect, then that choice moves you in a certain direction. It changes the way that you talk. It changes the way that you treat people. And ultimately, it just becomes a habit. And a habit is something that you, a, a really good habit that you have, 
It's not something that you think about. It's something that is intuitive to you. It's something that you are going to do every day, all the time. I get up every, I get up every morning, first thing, one of the first things I do is I brush my teeth. I take a shower, I'm in the shower, I get out, I get ready, I brush my teeth. Even if I've got a note that I'm going to brush them a little bit later, it, I, it's just a habit. I don't even think about it. I don't actually think about doing it. I just, it's, it's a habit. And I do it. Why? Because I know that if I brush my teeth, that it's going to be beneficial to me. I clearly understand that that infection in the mouth creates disease in the body. Right now, now so I ought to make it. So I made a choice. It moves me in a certain direction, and now it has become it has become a habit. So it's clear that either direction that you may choose, say disrespect or respect, either one, either one that you make, starts with a personal choice that you make at some point, at some time in your life. Now I'm going to say to you as your pastor, I'm going to treat you with respect. And I'm going to treat you with kindness. I'm going to treat you as graciously as I, as I know how. I'm not going to give you a good reason not to like me, if I can say it that way. Uh, I'm going to love you. I'm going to love on you. I'm going to honor you. I'm going to honor your, uh, uh, your family. Uh, I, I want to be a good pastor to you. That's a decision. Everybody understand what I'm saying? That's a decision that I've made in the past. I made a long time ago. And that decision moves me in a certain direction, and I want it to be the obvious, clear habit of my life. So every habit, every one of these directions that you choose starts with a, I want you to write these two words down, it, it starts with a personal choice that you make. It starts with a personal choice that you make. Now I want you to... Look at uh, Joshua chapter 24. This is uh, Joshua speaking. They've gone out. If you understand how the book of Joshua is, how the book of Joshua is broken down, it's the first 12 chapters talk about the conquering of the land and then the second about the division of the land. And so at the end here, Joshua gets and uh, he's, he's speaking to the people and in verse 15, he makes this statement. I'm going to read it for you. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord. Now, obviously, these people had a problem. They had some kind of problem. And he's having to talk to them about it. He says, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose, make a choice, make a personal choice for yourselves, this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father ser served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but it's for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So what did Joshua do? Joshua made a what? Choice. A choice. He made a personal decision for me and my house we are going to serve the Lord. Now that's the decision that I want everybody in this, this church to make. So what we know is that these people, if you go back and study it, that these people had made some really bad decisions in their life. And Joshua was confronting them. I'm, I guess that's the right word. He was confronting them and then he was compelling them to do what? What was he compelling them to do? Tell me. Right. Make a choice. To make the right choice. To make a godly choice in their life that they and their house were going to actually serve the Lord. Uh, I think if you look at verse 23, Joshua 24, 23, he's continuing this. He says, "There Now therefore, put away the foreign gods which are among you. In other words, let me, let me say that in a way that's a little bit more contemporary. Put away 
make a choice to put away all of those things in your life that you know are not honoring to God. Put them away. Incline your heart to the Lord, but put these things away in your life that are not benefiting you or not benefiting anybody else. And number two, incline your heart to the Lord God of Israel. Turn your heart to the things of God. So, once again, he's, he's imploring these people to make a choice. I want you to put away, I want you to put down, I want you to stop, I want you to quit, I want you to sever from your life all of those things in your life that you know are not honoring to God. In our terminology, it would be that are not honoring to Christ, not bringing glory to God. I want you to put them away. And the way that I want you to do that is that I want you to make a choice that you are going to incline your heart to the Lord God Almighty. It's just a choice, right? Everybody look up here. It's, it's just a choice. Either you make that choice in your life. Everybody, I have to make that choice. You have to make that choice. Am I going to live the way that I want to live, or, or am I going to live in a way that should honor and please God? Which am I going to do? I have to choose. I have to make a personal choice. So it was clear that they had to choose who they were going to serve. They had to choose whether or not they were willing to put away the idols that they had, all these little trinkets and things that they brought out of, of uh, uh, Egypt. You remember what happened at Ai and why they got defeated and they went back to the guy's house. I forget what his name was. And he had, when they had gone in, they had gotten some, some little gods and they brought them back and buried them. The whole family had, had the whole family had, Worshipped them and and uh, it cost them their life. It was Aiken, right? And uh, A C H A N, right? <laughs> and uh, and it, it was a choice that each one would have to make. Now I want to add, I want to add to the principle that our choices create our habits. I want you to write this down, okay? I don't want to call them principles, but I, I'll give them to you just as kind of dogmas a little bit. Our priorities create our choices. So we have choices that create habits. The habit is the last thing on the, on the scale here. We make a choice. And what I just said is that our priorities are what create our priorities are what create our choices. They drive and influence our choices. If I were to ask you today, if I would just be really simple about this, and I'd, I'd say, what are the priorities that you have for your life? What are the real priorities that you have? Do you have any priorities? Do you know, do you know what you want to do? Do you know what you want to become? Do you know exactly how you want to live? Do you have goals that you want to reach? What are the priorities that you have in your life? I have priorities. I have real, genuine priorities in my life that, that drive me, that influence me. There are choices that I've made, uh, uh, and every day of my life, they influence me in a good direction, they, they, and they should. Uh, I mean, what do you actually want your choice? Where do you want your choices to take you? Maybe I could ask the question in a different way. Where do you want your life to be in five years? Or where do you want your life to be in ten years? What do you want it to look like? Do you just want to be comfortable and convenient? you want to have a lot of money? you want to just travel all over the world and all that kind of stuff? I can assure you that getting on planes all the time is not any fun. It will slap wear you out. Going from time zone to time zone to time zone, from this city to that city, rushing, being late, being delayed, all of that kind of stuff. I remember when my, I was getting some cancer treatment in, in Switzerland, and my wife and I, we got off the plane in Zurich, and we, we, <laughs> we, had, to catch a, we had to catch a train. And the, and the trains in Switzerland are on time. It's not like going to church, right? They're on time, and they leave on time. And they don't ask you whether or not you're going to get on or not get on. And we had all this luggage with us and 
because we were going to be there for two weeks, uh, and uh, it was just a, it was just a, a uh, we were going to be there for a long time with the treatments, and and we barely could get we barely got on the train. I, I barely I, I barely got on. I was slapped worn out just getting on the train. Then we got on the train. We didn't know where to get off. I, I'd never been to Switzerland before. It's a beautiful place. Uh, they have a national kind of identity that they want to keep it clean, and they do. And so, we all have priorities. Now, I want to give you, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. I'm doing better, Ed. This is a verse that ought to help you define what your priorities should be. I think it gives definition to what should be one of our godly priorities. It says, therefore, whether you eat or drink. Now, if you have a pencil or a pen and you don't mind writing in your Bibles, I think that you ought to underline the next three words. Or what are four words or whatever no it's three words no four words or whatever you do or whatever you do right I, I had to be careful because Daniel would catch me and correct me right last time I did that and couldn't count or whatever you do wherever you go whoever you meet Whatever kind of job you have, wherever you live, whatever you decide your priority should be, whatever you do, however you live, look at it. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or, or, or whatever you do, it doesn't really matter. Do all to the glory of God. So whatever your priorities are, this is what... You and I measured them against. Is what I am doing in my life, is it bringing glory to God? Listen, if it's not bringing glory to God, you need to be, I need to be, like the people that Joshua talked to, and I need to put away those things in my life that are not honoring to Christ. I need to put them away. Because whatever it is that I do, God wants it to be something that honors Him. So the test is simple. It's what I'm doing, bringing glory to God. That's the test. I give my students tests all the time, right? To see what they know. It's not difficult to have the wrong priorities. We live in a culture that creates bad priorities. I think what was so obvious about Jesus was that every priority that he had in his life was the right priority. Every priority that he had, he didn't make, he never made any bad choices, right? I mean, he never, he never made any bad choices. So whatever habits he had, you know, places where it says, and it, as it was his custom, he had the right priorities. Even as a young boy, he's in the temple and his parents leave without him and they come back and they try to find him and he's sitting in there. He's not teaching anybody, he's just asking questions. And his parents sort of rebuke him, his mother sort of rebukes him and he says, he says, I, I need to be about my father's business. What would you call that? Tell me the word. I'm, just give me the word. It's his priority. He had the right priority. I must be about my father's business. Doing what God wants me to do. What was he, he had all the right priorities. So, And then we have priorities that create our choices, that create our habits. And then what creates our priorities are our values. Our convictions, what we believe, 
I mean, I mean, what do you really believe? What kind of values do you have? Because your, your values are going to drive your priorities, which are going to drive your choices, which are going to drive your habits. People that I know that have godly values, they make a lot better choices in their life. It's just obvious. It's like the handwriting on the wall. I mean, you can just see it. It's just there. If we have the wrong values, then we'll have the wrong priorities. Our choices are driven by our priorities, and our priorities are created by our values. Either we are people of deep, deep, godly convictions and values, or we are not. Either today you have deep, godly convictions that are driving your priorities, that are creating your choices, that are driving your habits, or you don't have that. And if you don't have the right values, you'll certainly never have the right priorities, you'll never make the right choices, and you'll always get the wrong results. I want you to turn to Psalm 119, verse 30. Psalm 119, verse 30. David is speaking here. And he says, he says, I have, I'll wait till you get there. He says, I have chosen the way of truth. I made a choice. I stopped. I thought about something. I've chosen the way of truth. And your judgments, your truth, your principles, I have laid before me. I put them in front of me. I put your truth in front of my life. So that whenever I'm out and about, whenever I'm doing something, whenever I'm making a decision, I have your truth laid out before me to help give me clarity and direction for the choice that I have to make. That was David's priority. He knew that he had to choose God's best for his life, or he wanted to choose God's best for his life. So what he did is that he took the truth of God and he laid it before his life. If I can say it this way, in, in just a way that makes sense to me, he put it in front of him. He just put it right there in front of him so that he always knew what it was that God wanted him to do. He had to always keep the truth as his priority. He knew that he had to choose, which is what he did. I'm going to choose the way of truth. I have to make a choice every day. Every day of my life, I have to make a choice. I've made a big choice in the past, but every day I have to make little choices. I, it's a, I want it to be a godly habit. Every day I have to choose, you have to choose, whether or not we're going to do what God wants us to do or we're not going to do what God wants us to do. You can compromise if you want to. I can compromise if I choose. But I have to make a choice. Am I going to compromise? Am I going to say something that I don't want to say? Am I going to curse at somebody? You're never going to hear me curse at somebody. Why? Because why? Why? Somebody tell me why I'm not going to. Choose not to. I've chosen not to because I have certain values that create priorities for my life, and I'm not going to curse at somebody. It's just I don't even have to think about it. So every day you make choices, some good, some bad, and then those choices make you. You cannot prevent that from happening. You cannot prevent your choices from having their impact on your life. If you make the wrong choices, you're going to get the wrong results. You cannot change that. You might can slow it down a little bit or whatever, but every bad choice and every good choice that you've made has some kind of impact on your life. I was thinking about this. And forgive me if I sound a little bit arrogant, all right? Just forgive me. Every one of us here today is a visual snapshot of the choices that we have made in our life. 
just you know how you have your cell phone and you can go and you take a snapshot, you know, and you put it on portrait or whatever, and you you can just you just go up to somebody, you take a snapshot of of of, of somebody. It gives you a picture of their life. I, I mean, of of them at that moment in time. But you can look at my life. I can look at your life. We've seen enough visual snapshots of each other. We can look at each other's life. Here's what we can do. We can look at what we talk about. We can see what it is that we look at. We can look at where we go. We can look at how we treat people. We can look at how we spend our money. We can look at how we protect our resources or how we keep up our property. We can look at the friends that we have. We can just look and look and look and look. And just by looking, just by looking at the snapshot of somebody's life, we get a clear picture of what, it, of what means the most to us and what are, are our priorities. As your pastor, for those of you that I've known for a long time, I, I can just look at your life. I, I know what's important to you. I see you week after week. I see you during the week. We fellowship. We, we, uh, we, we talk. We, we text. We, we have remind. We have different. We have Facebook. We have this. We have that. We get pictures. We see what people are doing. Micah sent me this uh, uh, prayer, uh, uh, this uh, liturgical prayer. I just thought it was great. I, I said, why don't you pray this in church for us this morning? You know, I, it's just, it's just, everybody's life is a snapshot. You, you are where you are in your life, especially spiritually, because of the choices that you've made. Everybody see that? Yeah, yes or no? Yes. That's clear, right? <laughs> that, that's clear. You can look at my life. I made, I made choices. To live a certain way, my wife and I have made choices to live a certain way. I've tried to pass that down to my children as best I could. I try to pass that down to you. You've done the same thing. You've done exactly the same thing. And those choices are going to have an impact later on down the road. Now, I want you to think of growing in your spiritual life as something, write this word down, this is the key word, as something that you do incrementally. It's something that you do incrementally. You must grow slowly to be strong spiritually. I think that's what I would write down. We grow slowly so that we can be strong spiritually. You do not want, and I know this is going to sound like an oxymoron. It, I probably ought to, it's, I think you would think that what I really ought to say is that we want to grow as fast as we can. I don't want to say that. I want to say the exact opposite. I said, I, I want to say, to you that spiritual growth is never fast. It's never fast. In fact, if it's fast, there's something actually wrong with it. Think of making godly choices and developing godly habits as just becoming a little bit better each day of your life, each week of your life. So that at, let's say at the end of this next week, you can just you can just step back a little bit, you can look at your life, and you can say, you can see, well, this, I had a goal. What's my goal? Everybody tell me what my goal is. Somebody tell me. Okay. Good right. Right. Just stop talking when somebody's interrupted me. All right. And what that's helping me to do is not to interrupt somebody else when, when, when they're talking to me, right? And I mean, that's the real goal, is that if you're talking to me, I want to be listening to you and not interrupting you, all right? So the way that I'm working on it is sort of backwards. Uh, I just stop talking when somebody interrupts me. It reminds me that, Gary, that's not what you want to do, all right? So I want to be able to look back at the end of the week and say, well, how did I do? I had a bad week uh, two weeks ago. I shared it with you, and I, I and I was in the car. My daughter and my wife and I were talking, and 
and uh, uh, they interrupted me, and so I just got louder. Bad. That was not good. It's not good. It's not good for me just to get louder and talk over them until I get say what I want to say. So finally, they they corrected me, and I said, "I have failed my test to speak." I didn't know you were Italian. Huh? I didn't know you were Italian. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not Italian. So. I don't think that you can sustain growing quickly. I, it, I don't think it works in the long term. I think having to have quick results is just a fast track to failure. I bet that the fast foods that you eat are the worst things that you eat, right? Chris is shaking his head. The fast foods that you eat, whether it's at Chick-fil-A or McDonald's or wherever it is, they're the worst foods that you eat. Have you ever read about what's in a McDonald's hamburger? It's not good. It's, it's not good. Fast foods are not good for you. And I think that you having to have quick results spiritually is a fast track to failure. This is, this is why most people fail at what we're addressing. It's because they don't have the patience and they don't have the perseverance and they don't have the endurance to just slow down and let God work in their life. I want you to think of it in terms of just improving, say, just give yourself a time frame, just 1% a week. Just 1%. If you interrupt people 100 times, maybe at the end of the week you only interrupted them 99. But I guarantee you, if you got to get to 100, some people are going to quit before they get to 10 because they think it's taking too long. All right, I'm going to keep working at it until I got it and I don't have to think about it and it becomes a godly habit in my life. I want to be able to look back at the end of the week and just see that I made some progress. The problem in developing small, slow, godly habits is that, everybody listen to me, this is the problem that you're going to face, is that there is no immediate payoff or reward. There's no immediate payoff. You don't get to see the results of it until later on down the road. So here's what you have to accept. You ought to write this down. Developing godly habits is a long-term process. Developing godly habits is a long-term process. Developing strong godly habits never happens quickly. You'll never see an oak tree become strong quickly. It doesn't happen. It takes years of growing for it to become strong. And so what you need is to be consistent. I'll give you two words. You need to be consistent and you need to be steady in developing godly habits in your life and doing what God wants you to do over an extended period of time. This is how you grow. This is how you grow spiritually. You always start with small Godly habits. Let me say that again. You always start with small, godly habits. Not big habits, not ungodly habits. You always start with small, godly habits. I, the, the, the one that I'm working on right now is a small habit. Just stop talking when somebody interrupts me. Blah, 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 blah. It's easy. I don't have to. I'm getting to the point that I don't, I don't think about it much anymore. I think the small godly habits are much easier to sustain. Now, I, I want to anchor something in your mind this morning. I want, I want you to let me do this, okay? I want to anchor it into your mind. I want you to write this down. I want it to just kind of be like cement. It just gets anchored into your mind so that you think this way about these issues. Here it is. Your path to being spiritually successful is simple. I'll, I'll give you what, this, what it is. Your path to being spiritually successful is simple. 
Okay, write this down. Consistently. Consistently do small, mundane, unexciting, daily disciplines over an extended period of time. Let me say that again. Consistently do small, mundane, unexciting daily disciplines over a long period of time. And I can just hear, I can just hear you thinking to yourself, oh wow, Gary, I can hardly wait. I can hardly wait to do mundane things for a long time. I, I just I can just hear you thinking that in, in, in your mind. That sounds so exciting, Gary. Pastor, I don't think I've ever heard anything that profound in my life. If you want to grow spiritually, you better anchor that into your brain. Tattoo that into your neurons, into your synapses. Tattoo that into your brain. You want to do the things that are mundane, that are small, that are not that exciting, that are disciplines that you should have in your life every day. You want to do it for an extended period of time. And you'll grow. Trust me, you will grow up. If you think you have a better idea, then have at it. But you need to understand that small, doing small godly things over and over and over it's what creates spiritual growth. Helps to create spiritual growth in your life. This is how you develop a godly habit. You start small. You start godly. I think, I think the habit I'm working on is a godly habit. It's a good habit. It's a small habit. Think of it as working on small godly habits. Every choice you make Every choice that you make becomes a behavior that eventually leads to a habit. Every choice that you make leads to a certain kind of behavior, pushes you in a certain direction, and that direction eventually becomes a habit in your life. You may not even know that it's become a habit until it's too late. Every choice that you make, no matter how big or how small, in some way it alters the trajectory of your life. It can be good. It can be bad. If you take an honest look at the habits that you do have, the first thing you will see is that there are some bad habits that you need to eliminate from your life. Let me ask a question here. Everybody look up here for a minute. Is there anybody here that doesn't have any bad habits in your life? Raise your hand. Is there anybody here that doesn't have any bad habits? Please be honest, transparent. Micah doesn't have any bad habits. <laughs> I think we all have bad habits that we can improve on. For instance, let's just say that you are habitually irritable or frustrated or grumpy. That's the easy thing, you know, just get irritated at people, get short with them, get a little frustrated with people. If that ever happened to you? You've been frustrated with somebody? Then you need to eliminate each of those negative behaviors because if you don't, they become bad habits in your life. Trust me, there's nobody that you know that enjoys your being grumpy and irritable and short with them. There's nobody. I don't enjoy it. You don't enjoy it. So it's just something in your life that you have to recognize this is not what God really wants for my life.
There's a keystone habit that you need to understand and develop, and it's a simple one, so listen carefully. I'm going to give you two really keystone habits. These are the ones that I want you to concentrate on. I'll give them to you this morning. The first one is that you build godly habits into your life. This may, this may sound backwards to you, but just forgive me, I don't think it is. You build godly habits before you try to break bad habits. You build godly habits before you try to break bad habits. I want you to start with what? Somebody tell me. Small, godly habits. Whatever they are, you, you, you figure out what it is that you need to do, what kind of habit that you want to put in. Just start building some small godly habits. Always focus on godly habits first because what you'll find is that as you begin to build godly habits in your life, you work on it, you begin to build them into your life, that discipline will ultimately, inevitably purge out and cleanse your life of the bad habits. If I can say it in a different way, it's almost like the more good habits that you have in your life, the less room you have for bad habits. Everybody see that? Yes or no? Yes. The more good habits you have, the less room you have for the bad habits. You don't have as much time. Always focus and concentrate more on building godly habits than removing and eliminating the bad habits. Now, I want to give you a verse for this. I want you to go to 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. It's the last verse in that chapter or that book. We've gone over this many times in the past, but I want to go over it again. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 18 says, this is what Peter wants them to do. He wants them to be steadfast. He wants them to be growing. He says, but grow in grace, in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. So here's what you want to do. Just listen to me carefully. You want to grow in all of the right things. You want to grow in grace. You want to grow in knowledge. You want to grow in kindness. You want to grow in, in, in love. You want to grow in your patience. You want to grow in everything that Jesus would grow in. Was he patient? Yes. Uh, was he kind? Yes. Did he care about people? Yes. Was he a servant? Yes. Those are the things that you want to grow in. Peter did not say in this verse, look at verse 18, he did not say before you can grow in grace and knowledge, you've got to get rid of all of your bad habits. He didn't say that at all. He didn't say you've got to get rid of your bad habits first. He said, I want you to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said to start with the really good things. So you have to be very intentional and deliberate about developing Godly habits in your life. Your habits, good or bad, always have a great impact on determining where you are headed spiritually. Listen, if I, if I, if I knew what your habits were, if I just somehow intuitively knew God revealed to me in some way what your habits were, I think that I could tell you where you're headed. Because your habits are going to dictate your behavior. And your behavior is going to dictate your results. Let me give you the simplest way to break a bad habit. You, you have to write this down. This is, this is a keystone habit. You have to write this down. This is so important. This is so simple. This is one of those principles that for me is so profound that I almost laugh at myself for saying it. 
Here it is. You break a bad habit by replacing it with a good habit. Let me say that again. You break a bad habit by replacing it with a good habit. It's generally accepted. I think we studied some of this in our series on Connecting My Mind With My Life, that it takes about three weeks to break a bad habit. Now, obviously, that's a little bit misleading because some habits, if you've been an alcoholic for 40 years, you're not going to break that habit in three weeks. It's just not going to happen. But let's just say you, you, you've developed a bad habit in your life and you want to get rid of it, then you can break that habit research shows in about three weeks. And then it takes about three to six weeks to build a good habit to replace it. So over a period of time, if you take three, even plus six, it's nine weeks, that's a little bit more than two months to break a really bad habit and replace it with a good one. That's not a long time frame in my mind. Two, two months, I mean, February will be gone here before we know it. So in the big picture, it's just not a difficult time frame to make meaningful changes in your life. So let me give you a good example. These are just stupid examples. These are Gary stupid examples. What's a good example of having a bad, of replacing a bad habit with a good habit? You could come up with some. Let's say that you don't brush your teeth that often. What do you want to do? You want to start brushing your teeth much more often, right? And you struggle with it. Put it on your phone. Have your phone go off at the same time every day. You know, put a note on your, on your mirror. Brush your teeth today, Gary. Just do it. it. It's a trigger. It reminds you that you want to do something. Let's say you drive too fast. What's the good habit that you want to replace that? Somebody tell me. Tell me, Chris. Slow down. But you don't want to slow down. You've got to have a trigger. You've got to have something that reminds you, I don't want to go fast. I want to go slower. I want to go the speed limit. Sometimes when I use Waze on my, in, my, in Brenda's car, um, um, it has a little thing up there. It gives you the speed limit. And then right above it, if you're going over the speed limit, it turns red and tells you what you're going. If, you're, if it's a 45 and you're going 57, it's got 45 and 57. And there have been plenty of times when my wife would say, you're going to get a what? A ticket. And I know exactly why she's telling me that, so that I can slow down. Don't you hate the 45 all the way to Augusta? Well, I can't, I just, it's like... Chris, you need to get them to change, change the law or something. Just put a note on your dashboard until you slow down. I think that developing simple, godly, keystone habits are at the heart of your spiritual growth. Now, I want to give you, I want to give you a keystone habit that you need to develop. Write this down. This is probably not where you think it's going to be. Always be reminding yourself, let me say it simpler so you won't have to write so much. Always remind yourself Always remind yourself of what matters the most in life. Always remind yourself of what matters the most in life. It helps you to distinguish between what really doesn't matter at all. If you choose not to do that, then you will simply waste your life on things that literally have no eternal value whatsoever. You just never figured it out. You just never figured out 
that you had to know what really mattered and what really counted. And so you went on and you did your own thing. Did you have fun in the process? Yes, probably. Was it exciting to you? Probably it was. Did it create Christ-likeness in your life? Probably not. You had fun. You had all the fun that you could have. You had your high, you got your adrenaline rush, you did everything you wanted to do, but in the end, it did not matter. It had no value. It was the wrong priority for your life. You made the wrong choices. So you have to stop and ask yourself a very simple, profound question. At this difficult moment in my life, at this moment in my life, how does God want me to respond? You come across something that happens in your life that's very stressful, it's very difficult. Somebody says something ugly to you, somebody mistreats you, somebody does X or Y, whatever it might be. And it's a difficult moment and you have to stop. You have to ask yourself, what matters the most in my life? What is it that God right now wants me to do? How does God want me to respond to this difficult When the difficult moment comes, you stop what you're doing and you think about what you should do. Let me give it this way. All right, I'm going to make it simple. This is the way you ought to write it down. You stop. You think, and you choose. You just stop. Something's difficult. Something's going to get out of hand. Somebody, you're going to say something that you don't need to say. It could be in your marriage. It could be with your marriage partner. And it's getting elevated in your home, and your children are hearing it, and you stop. You just stop. And you think, what does God want me to do? What really matters the most in my life? And then you choose to do what you know God wants you to do. Most people don't stop. They don't think. And they choose to do what they want to do. Bad choice. Bad choices lead to bad results. If you're willing to just determine what matters the most in your life, then and only then will you be willing to do what God wants you to do. This is not something that you just kind of naturally do. It must be a habit. You have to see. In my mind, you have to visualize a difficult moment as a kind of spiritual trigger. This, this sounds insane to people, I'm sure. I don't know if you all know it, but Eddie takes all of everything that I teach, whether it's a course or a class or whether it's a, a message here at church. or It doesn't matter. He puts everything that I teach on every single media that he has. I don't know how many he has. I mean, I don't, I don't know how many he has, but he reaches... Thousands and thousands of people. And he puts all of this stuff out on his social media. And I know that some of them are going to be listening to this this next week. And they're going to say, well, that sounds crazy. You have to see your difficult moment as a trigger, a spiritual trigger that does something to you. It's difficult. It's stressful. What does the trigger want you to do? What's it there for? It's to remind you. It's to remind you. It's to help you to focus at that moment on what God wants you to do. This is a really stressful moment in my life. I'm going to stop. I'm going to think. God, what do you want me to do? I got it. That's what I'm going to do. So the difficult moment becomes the trigger. It's like if I want to go, uh, yesterday I walked uh, 
with all this cold weather, I haven't, I haven't walked any, literally. I just go to my cardio rehab, you know, and that's, I don't get a lot of walking there. And yesterday I walked that. So if I want to go walking today, the best thing I can do when I get home is to put my walking shoes out by the door or by my bed somewhere, somewhere where I can see it, by my desk. It's a trigger. I look at them today and I'm like, why did I put them there so I could go walking? Someone says something to you that's ugly and it hurts you and it offends you and it upsets you. You ever had that happen? Does that happen to you? Is that a real life experience where somebody just upsets you? Somebody at work, somebody in your home, somebody at your church, your pastor? They say something to you, it upsets you. What do you do? You stop. Everybody say it with me. You stop. You think. And then you choose to do what you know God wants you to do. What does God want me to do right now? How does God want me to respond right now? How does God want me to think right now? Every good habit needs a trigger. Every good habit needs a trigger, and being hurt or offended is a great trigger. You becoming upset is a trigger. It's a trigger. It ought to just remind you, I'm, this, not, this is not what God wants. What does God want? It ought to drive you back to Christ and to His Word and to His will. Here's what I want you to accept. I, I want you to accept this. Joshua reminded everybody that you got to think about what you're doing. Everybody listen to me very carefully. You cannot leave God out of your life and be spiritually successful. You cannot leave God out of your life and your choices and your decisions and be spiritually successful. You have to include Him in whatever it is that you do if you want to be successful. It's His will that matters a lot more than my will. Now, here's what I'm convinced of. So everybody, everybody pay attention. I'm convinced that God will not stop you from doing what you want to ultimately do. I'm convinced of that. If you just got this thing, you got to do it, you're going to do it, you're going to talk, you're going to talk the way you want to talk, you're going to treat people with disrespect, you're going to be unkind, you're not going to be gracious, you're going to be impatient about everything that happens. God's not going to stop you. He's not going to stop you from doing all of that. I want you to turn to Psalm 106, verse 15. Psalm 106, verse 15. Bad decisions come from being worldly minded, not spiritually minded, and having the wrong priorities and values for your life. This is what David said, or the psalmist said, about the people in the wilderness. It said in verse 13, they forgot his works. Number two, and they said it, that they did not wait for his counsel. They lusted exceedingly in the wilderness. They just wanted whatever it was they wanted, and they tested God in the desert. Verse 15 is really quite remarkable. It says, and he gave them their request. I've said it often, I'll say it again. Romans chapter 1, the worst thing God can do is give you what you want. He can give you what you want. I just got to have this. I don't care, I don't care. This is what I want, this is what I want to do, this is how I want to talk. It's the worst thing that can happen to you. To me, that's almost a kind of judgment. It says three times in Romans chapter 1 that they wanted this, and it says that God just gave them over and said, Do you want to be a drunk? Go ahead, be a drunk. You want to curse? Go ahead and curse. You want to live 
without God in your life, you want to just think that you're smart and above everything else in life, well, just go ahead. God will just give you over to do whatever it is that you want to do. These people got what they wanted in the end. They got what they wanted. And it did not satisfy them. It was because they did not want what God wanted them to have. So God let them have what they wanted. And then in that process, it says here, just look at it, that God sent them leanness. Let me give you another word for leanness. Emptiness. You want to live without me? You want to make your choices without me? Go ahead. You will get emptiness. In the end, I would say they got nothing. What they thought would fill their life with fun and pleasure... Just let them empty. They keep looking for the next thrill and the next adrenaline rush and the next high and the next this and the next that. What people think they will experience is just a fleeting deception at best. Uh, there's a key phrase in the Bible that means a lot to me. It says, whatever is in the world is just passing away. Whatever you want that the world has to offer, you can get it. You can have it. The Bible says that it's just passing away. You're just wasting your life on things that don't really matter. You can become so enamored with doing your own thing that it drives you to a place that quickly blinds you to what really matters the most. Let me say this in a positive way. Hear my heart, church, you just hear my heart. Concentrate, concentrate, concentrate on the things in your life that help you to become Christ-like. Concentrate on those areas of your life that you know need some work that help you to become more like Christ. That should be your thinking. I always want to reflect Christ in my life. If He wants you to wait, what should you do? Wait. If He doesn't want you to say something, you shouldn't say anything. If He doesn't want you yelling at your kids, you shouldn't be yelling at your kids. Or your mate. If God doesn't want you to do something, please don't do it. Here's the habit that you want to develop. This is so super important. Write this down. In every difficult moment of your life, in every difficult moment of your life, you want to see yourself as becoming Christ-like. It's like a difficult moment comes into your life and you go, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! I get to respond in a Christ-like way. To all of this nonsense that's going on around me, I get to respond graciously to somebody that's ungracious. I get to say something kind to somebody that's unkind. I get to be good to somebody that's bad. You must learn to think this way. This is how you want to see yourself responding. You want to see yourself always responding like this. I choose to be Christ-like. I choose. I make a choice. I choose to be Christ-like and not un-Christ-like. I choose not to say what I want to say. I choose not to curse. I choose to be gracious. Make a choice. Your choices create your habits. You figure out what to say to yourself when this happens to me, and it will. I'm going to respond this way. That's how I'm going to respond. If that happens to me, that's how I'm going to respond. What can you say that will direct your attention back to God? 
Go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. says it this way let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus let this mind be in you listen don't make that head knowledge don't just allow that to just be head knowledge in your life something that Paul said to the Philippians, let that mind be in you that was also in Christ. How do you want me to respond, O oh Lord God? If you don't have a habit like this in your life, then you will invariably say or do what God does not want you to say or do. Listen, I'm convinced that if you don't know where you're going, any path will get you there. If you don't know where you're going, any road will take you to where, to that place. Nowhere. Here's the principle. Whatever you consistently think about eventually becomes what you consistently do. I have to ask myself the right questions to get the right answers. I have to be willing to make changes in order to change. I can't change unless I change. If God wants me to, this whole series is entitled Embracing Change. Why, why do I want to call it Embracing Change? Because I know that God wants every one of us to make changes in our life. We have to embrace it. We have to let this mind be in us that was also in Christ Jesus. And the best way to change something in your life that's not pleasing to God is to simply do what you know is pleasing to God. That's so profound to me. Everything that's simple is profound. If you know that it's not pleasing to God, then don't do it. Do what you know is pleasing to God. If you curse a lot or talk ugly to people, God will not use you until you change your speech. If you talk ugly to people, if you talk unkind to people, I don't ever talk unkind to somebody at Walmart. I don't even like going to Walmart. I don't ever talk unkind to people. You know, people get, get in these lines and they, they just complaining about this and that. <clears throat> you have to learn how to talk to people in a way that honors God. You have to be gracious and kind and patient in what you say. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Just turn back one page probably. Chapter 4 verse 29. This is what it says. Look at this many times. It says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but only that which is good for edification that it may. Listen to this. If you're underlining anything in your Bible, underline these two words. Impart grace. Don't let anything come out of your mouth that's corrupt, that's bad, that's wrong. Don't curse. Don't say unkind things. Don't let anything come out of your mouth unless you know that it's going to be able to impart grace to the people that are listening to you. The habit you have to develop in your life if you want this to be real to you is to learn to say only that which will edify the person that you are addressing. You have somebody, it's a little tense, you don't know what to do. And you want to just speak your mind to them? Why? Why do you want to do that? You know it's not what God wants you to do. Don't do it. Godly words, good words, impart grace to other people. You want to be a vessel of God's grace? It starts with your words. It starts with kindness. Kindness. Mercy. From this verse right here, I know exactly. I, I know exactly how God wants me to respond to somebody and how He wants me to talk to them. Do you see that? Look at the verse. Do you see that? 
You cannot let this verse, a verse like this, just be head knowledge. You can't do it. That's the whole purpose of this series. This is what I'm begging for. This is the paradigm shift. That we become fully devoted, committed disciples and followers of Jesus Christ in every single area of our life. A lot of Christians, this is just head knowledge, just words on a piece of paper that have never really reached their heart. And the evidence of this is that they just continue to talk to people however they want to talk to them. It doesn't really matter to them. They're just going to say what they want to say. That is so stinking spiritually wrong. I don't even know how to say it. I have no idea what to call it other than just sheer absolute disobedience. Let me say one more thing and I'll close. In part, grace to everyone that you meet. You go out to eat today, in part, grace to the waiter. Impart grace to everyone that you know, to every member of your family, and every encounter that you have. And Intentionally choose to impart grace to people. And as you do, as you make that choice, as you have the right values, you'll have the right priorities that will help you to make the right choices that create these kind of habits in your life where somebody looks at you and they know that you are always imparting grace to somebody that desperately needs it. Amen? Amen? Father, we come to you today and we are just I'm desperate. I'm desperate to know you more. To know you in a deeper way. Lord, I'm desperate, I'm desperate to choose you. To choose you in every decision that I have. To get rid of any bad habits, any irritability, any frustration that comes across in my voice and in my life and in my words to just get rid of them. Develop a habit. Whatever I do that honors you and glorifies you. I pray, Father, that you would take a message like today and just drive a stake into our life. Just drive a stake into our life where we know that we're going to begin to make the choices that we need to make so we can develop godly habits in our life that we execute successfully every single day. Thank you, Father, for being our model. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.